Hi guys, I'm getting my tech. There we go. Can everybody see this shared screen? Can you hear me? Looks great. And you've got the shared screen. This is a little different um, from uh, some of the other presentations. This is about how I use and how we use now. Um, we have this uh, graduate program in, uh, in anatomy called the PT program. We have some fabulous uh, graduates out of that program of which Lauren is one. So well done. So this is about how I come to teach based on what I knew about anatomy. I'm simply an anatomist and I'm certainly not a, a cognitive or a neuroscientist. Um, this is how about I've learned how to use basic cognitive strategies for teaching anatomy. Um, and anatomy has generally been regarded as a very boring subject. And I hope that getting these strategies into my teaching and into the student learning, more important, makes it not so much about memory, but about learning. And uh, learning, I've got one definition of learning. It says an increase through experience of problem solving activity. So it's not straight about memorization. Anyway, let's get on with this. Okay. Is that the second one? Whoops. There we go. Memory pathways. We'll go through this very quickly. What happens is sensory input comes in usually through the ears and the eyes. In a very short time, a couple of seconds goes into the sensory memory, and then it gets transferred into this, the workhorse of the brain, with a working memory. The working memory takes the new sensory memory and integrates it, as you can see the arrows going the other way, with what's in the long-term memory to produce a new, uh, new uh, long-term memory. So again, work in memory takes in new memory, takes in new information, takes in the stuff that relates to it, works on it for 12 or so seconds, and then transfers it into the long-term memory. It goes also through a stage called recent memory, which we'll talk about later, because it's important in one other thing. But it is in the long-term memory that the memory is stored in the cortex of the brain in the form of schemas. Here we go. This is a grotesque oversimplification of what a schema looks like. So schema A and schema B would be too grossly simple. Um, uh, diagrams of what a memory is. And um, so Memory A would be the, the stars here, and it would be in these various parts of the brain that I won't bother you with. And, and again, grossly oversimplified. So say the memory of a fire truck would be uh, four wheels, you know, a couple of things lining up in the cortex of your brain. Uh, red, uh, it has a ladder on it, a bunch of guys with, and women with helmets. So that is what a schema is. A schema is the long-term memory on the, in the cortex of the brain where it is recorded, sorry. Okay, so these processes are working memory encodes into the recent memory. And this is important for one reason in learning. And it's based in a part of the brain called the hippocampus. There's no exam, by the way, at the end of this. Uh, and it's consolidated into the long-term memory as schema. And then, as we said, when new stuff comes into the working memory, we retrieve the, the schema that are cogent and pertinent with the new memory. And that builds on, again, goes back to new adjusted long-term memory. Sometimes not just memory added, but sometimes the working memory and the long-term memory collaborate with each other to make the long-term memory simpler. It doesn't have to be more complicated. Next we go to, so what are the teaching strategies based on this? One, there's cognitive load theory, dual encoding, bridging and chunking. 
and then these marvelous learning strategies, post-encoding sleep consolidation and retrieval practice. Okay, so I've told you what I'm gonna tell you, now I'm gonna tell you. So cognitive load reflects the fact that input into the working memory is extremely limited, five to seven items. Remember the phone number? That's a, a very good example of uh, a, a, a cognitive load that is relevant. So there are three kinds of cognitive load. Intrinsic, which is the stuff you want them to know. Germane load is how the new stuff is related to the schema in the long-term memory. And so these two are useful. And then, whoop, and then we get extraneous load, which is also referred to in the uh, in cognitive science as junk. So you shouldn't, if you want really to get what your subject matter is across to students, you shouldn't start embellishing with stuff that really, really does not help them learn. And that's what extraneous load in. So the cognitive load should be shared by intrinsic load and germane load. And cognitive load is very small. So no extraneous load, no talking about your grandma, unless it's pertinent. So now the next thing is dual encoding. And dual encoding is what the way we know, and this is really a good for an anatomy professor. Images, pictures of what you're doing, or even equations, if you're a mathematician, I would guess, and then acoustic memory, speech. And these two go into the sensory memory and to the various parts of the brain. And again, through working memory, through recent memory, and into long-term memory where they add to the existing schema and make a new schema. This is really, really critical to teaching and learning. So both bridging and chunking are teaching modalities that are absolutely based on schema. Bridging is the process. I'm starting to read this and I shouldn't. Um, by which germane material is reintroduced as a building block for the ensuing class that you're gonna tell them you're learning about, I don't know the, going back to anatomy, the bones of the arm, and that's gonna be used when you talk about the muscles. So that's bridging forward. And then when we get to do, sorry to bore you with anatomy, it's not really that much. When we get to do the muscles, then we bridge back to the bones. And, and that again, uh, brings the schema back in to the working memory when we put in the new stuff and it makes, the, it, makes it much easier to learn. Now, this is a good one. This is the, um, the pineapple theory. It's called chunking. You know, when you get a pineapple, you gotta chunk it because you can't digest it if you try to eat, well, first of all, it's got nasty stuff on the outside and the leaves are gonna cut your lips. So what you gotta do is break it down into a series of chunks, which allow, strangely enough for digestion, not of the pineapple, but learning material and make it easy to relate ideas together. So again, it goes back to the new material, goes into the working memory as a small chunk. It can only be a small chunk. Again, it's very limited and then gets reintroduced to the schema in the long-term memory and it makes the whole pineapple easier to digest. And for those of you that like canned pineapple, it's pre-chunked for you. Okay, this is a beauty. This is an absolute, who knew this? I certainly didn't. Sleep consolidation is mother nature's gift for learning. So it's a process where the connections in the hippocampus, the recent memory that lasts actually quite a while, a few hours, and the long-term memory by this process of consolidation into the long-term memory. What happens if you encode stuff before you go to bed, say two hours beforehand, 
but you learn it, not learn it, but read it through. If you test the per if you test students and read it through before they go to bed, they'll get a certain mark. And you have to have a different bunch of students to do this, of course. If you test the same students again in the morning, they know more. They, I mean, it's quite bizarre. I mean, sleep on it, right? As, as Meatloaf said in his song, sleep on it. Things will get better in the morning. I won't sing for you now because you'd all go away. Um, so it's a completely wonderful, uh, wonderful thing. So just before you go to bed, read it through. In the morning, you'll know more because the long-term memory, the schema, have gotten together with the hippocampus and something, something um, called the thalamus. You see, in sleep, all the other input is lost. You don't smell, you don't, well, you might smell if you don't shower before you go, but you don't have a sense of smell. Um, you don't, uh, you can't touch the, you don't touch things, you can't feel hot and cold. So what happens is this little nucleus for sensory, uh, for sensory, uh, for feeling sensation um, is doing nothing. So what it does, it communicates with the hippocampus where the recent memory is, and then the hippocampus connects with the long-term memory in the cortex, which is going through slow wave sleep. And you know more. It's just completely bizarre. It's wonderful. Sleep on it, guys. And this is the last thing. Retrieval practice. It's the act of trying to remember stuff rather than rehearsing it, rather than studying. I'm going to tell you now to the grad students, you shouldn't study. Studying is bad. It doesn't work. And what you should do is try, and this study, 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 exam, <laughs> study. You've got to read it first to know it, and then do retrieval practice. In other words, try to recall it from your memory and then do it again. The interesting thing is that people who do retrieval practice and try to recall something and get it wrong do better on the exams once they figured out what was right. So there you go. Retrieval practice and sleep consolidation are excellent ways of students learning not memorizing, but learning the material. And this is a study that Mo Azam and I did on several classes at Queens and the people that did retrieval practice in a large scale anatomy exam. By the way, there's 280 people in one class and 260 in the next with whom we compared them. You can see that each one that we had to RP each class did better. So I've told you what I was going to tell you. I've told you, and I'm now telling you what I told you. The three T's of teaching. Cognitive load, dual encoding, bridging and chunking, the Pineapple Express, and learning strategies, post-encoding sleep consolidation, and retrieval practice. And thank you very much. <laughs>